Further debate. The member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Pleasure to engage in today's debate on the extension of the state of emergency, which I don't support. And earlier today, I delivered a petition of over 3,000 names of others who are in opposition or don't support a continuation of the state of emergency. But I will have to say, Speaker, listening to today's debate from the official opposition and the government has been dizzying, um, absolutely dizzying. I've heard the NDP explain the long list of abuses and lack of oversight and lack of transparency that the government has been engaged in during the state of emergency, um, the lack of committees, the the lack of knowledge about the COVID command table, a whole laundry list of wrongdoings in their view of the government during the state of emergency. But then they say they're going to support and extend that same state of emergency that they um, have such disagreement with. But then I also listen to the government house leader and the government house leader says uh, he's really looking forward that this is the final, it's winding down, that this state of emergency is only going to be for two weeks. Well, I'll remind the government house leader and every other member in this house that the initial state of emergency nearly four months ago was also just for two weeks. That initial state of emergency was for two weeks. And, and I would say to you, Speaker, and to members, it appears to me that there's been some form of addiction develop between the government and this unaccountable authority and executive power that it has uh, rested, that it has ownership now. And, and they don't seem to want to give up that unaccountable authority that they have. And it appears that the NDP don't want them to give it up either. But, Speaker, I, I want to, the, the central question to this state of emergency, in my mind, is will the state of emergency, will the continuation of the state of emergency, will it have a net positive benefit on the people of Ontario or not? That's the question that we need to wrestle. Is, are the people of Ontario going to be better off with a suspended democracy, with a legislative assembly that does not have voice for their concerns, that do not have votes on the policies that impact them? And to me, the, the answer is clear. That is not a benefit for the people of Ontario. And I also have to say that you know, a state of emergency, the, the very title of it tells us that we must deal with some new emerging crisis. Something is emerging that we're not quite certain of, and we have to have extraordinary authorities to deal with this emerging crisis. And I ask, Speaker, I ask the members of this House, what is emerging because when I look around the province, when I talk to people, when I hear from my constituents, what is emerging is ever more knowledge, ever more evidence that we have achieved the objectives, achieved the objectives that were stated, we have achieved them early, and significantly, and let me remind people, the stated objectives, which I think we all were in agree with, was to flatten the curve and to ensure that our hospital system was not overwhelmed and could not treat the uncertain surge that may have arrived. We met those objectives back, certainly in late April, certainly without a question by, by May, um, 
the, the objectives had been met. And since throughout this, what has been emerging is knowledge, evidence. No longer are we in those days of such great uncertainty and such great misinformation and lack of knowledge about COVID. I'll, I'll remind them, people, uh, everyone. Now, I was reading the, um, a study by um, the Kingston Health Sciences Centre a couple of weeks ago. It was done by Dr. Gerald Evans. He's the Medical Director of Infection Control. And they've done a study, and this is what he said about COVID. And this is from a, a reputable Canadian research institute, not from the WHO and not from some other politicized bodies. But Speaker, he says, we now know that to get infected with this virus, you have to be in close contact with another person, and that contact has to be for a significant amount of time. It's not 10 or 15 minutes, it's hours. It needs to be in a closed environment, within a house, and in that environment there has to be a significant amount of contamination. Speaker, we, the same information was released by the University of British Columbia, their health sciences centre as well. Um, you know, so we're, we're learning more. We know how to deal with this virus in a much greater, um, with much greater awareness. Um, and of course, he goes on in this, another home-like setting where COVID-19 can spread like wildfire is long-term care facilities and retirement homes. And we know that to be true as well. The tragedy in long-term care, the decisions made by this government during this crisis on long-term care, I think when they're measured, when they're counted, they will, they will not look good. Bad decisions were made, decisions that compounded and amplified that tragedy in long-term care. But he also goes on that, that this virus um, does not infect or impact youth. Okay? If you're elderly, you are much more susceptible. So I, I would encourage all members, Dr. Gerald Evans, the Medical Director of Infection Control at the Kingston Health Sciences Centre. Okay? The same was done at UBC. And we also saw that just uh, in the last week or two, another report by, by Six, Sick Kids Hospital um, stating quite clearly that schools should remain, should open this fall. And I'll just read a little bit of, of that guidance document from six ki Sick Kids. Um, children have suffered anxiety, depression, loneliness, and face greater risk of family discord and abuse during this lockdown. All experts agree, um, you know, that requiring masks could lead to more infection, not less, while separating children as they socialize outside the classroom would have negative psychological effects. These are statements from sick kids. See, this is what is emerging, Speaker, is knowledge, is evidence. And, and it disturbs me that this government is conducting itself as if it was still March 17th, not June 23rd or 22nd. We've learned a lot. We've learned a lot. But we have not taken what we've learned and put it into practice. We are keep continuing to tell people that we are in this 
emergent crisis and that we must keep our democracy from functioning. We must keep it suspended. Speaker, you know, it's beginning. If one was somewhat cynical, they would say that is this more of a calm strategy than, a, uh, than an emergency strategy? Is this more of a PR scheduling than a COVID pandemic crisis? But, but you know, the, the experts are telling us what they have found. But we've also seen it with our own eyes. You know, we have seen you know, a number of weeks ago, when that great number of people were out in Trinity Bellwoods Park in downtown Toronto. And they were referred to as yahoos. Has there been a spike from that congregation? No, there hasn't. We saw the same thing um, a few weeks ago as well, when, when public health officials, on one hand, were saying... Um, Keep isolated, keep your social distancing, but go out in the tens of thousands to attend protests. And they did. Many, many tens of thousands of people in Ontario, in Toronto, Ottawa, ever, other places, went and protested. Even the Prime Minister of the country. Has there been a spike? No, there hasn't. The numbers continue to drop and drop because you know it, another one was the this great this great risk of people going to their cottages and spreading the virus everywhere uh, and you couldn't go to your cottages except for if you stunk out late at night I guess uh, uh, but speaker those cottagers have now been going throughout rural Ontario and still, there is no spike. So both anecdotally, plus scientific research demonstrates we're gaining knowledge. We have achieved the objectives. But I think what COVID has done, it has laid bare for us all to see the great, great significant challenges that this province will have to deal with. And they are, they're great. They're huge. You know, as we look out and see the millions of people who are idled and unemployed, who have no work, that is going to be a challenge. The tens and tens of thousands of businesses that will never reopen again. That is going to be a challenge. It'll challenge our municipal governments with a shortage of revenues. It'll challenge the provincial government and its revenues. At the same time, we'll be having increasing demands on needs. The bankruptcies, the foreclosures, the stalled medical treatments. The Thunder Bay Hospital announced a, a couple weeks ago they expect it will take over a year to deal with the backlog of essential medical treatments that have been postponed indefinitely. We are going to have to deal with that. The whole generation, we have a significant generation of young people saddled with significant student debt with few employment opportunities. We're going to have to deal with that. These are the great challenges that COVID has laid bare. The, how are we going to assist those many families with autistic children? That's been on the table for a long time. And I say to you, Speaker, this state of emergency is taking our eye off these challenges. This state of emergency is not helping us 
examine these great problems. This state of emergency is deflecting our important examination of these challenges. And I really ask all members, what are we here for? Are we here to represent our constituents, to give voice to their concerns, to be advocates against injustice that they may face? Or are we here for others to do the bidding of others? Are we here, are we pieces of furniture, or are we advocates for our constituents? I know where I stand. A state of emergency limits, precludes, and frustrates every member in this House from discharging their responsibilities. And Speaker, once again, we have this COVID command table who we don't know who they are making the decisions. The Premier refuses to release who's there. We don't know the, there's no transparency. There's no accountability. But they want to continue with this. I've brought this up in the last motion. I'm going to bring it up again. Others have also spoken about it with the NDP. And I move that this motion be amended by adding the following to the end. And that during this extension, the work product of the Ontario COVID-19 command table, including agendas, minutes, and communications, and excluding correspondence that is protected by cabinet confidentiality be made available to the public in a timely fashion with a compendium of this disclosure tabled with the house on a weekly basis that the initial disclosure be of any and all existing work product and that each monday shall be tabled the compendium from the preceding work thank you speaker Mr. Hillier has moved an amendment to the motion that we're debating. Again, I'll recognize the member to continue his presentation. Thank you, Speaker. I'll, I'll wrap up here. The, I, I do hope all members consider um, my perspectives, the perspectives that I'm sharing that I know others have as well, um, in the perspectives of, of this House and perspectives of what comes next, right? Because we do have, we have huge problems. If we thought the problems that we've had in the last four months were big, consider, consider the hurt, the harm, the consequences that are out there. And I, and I think the better and the sooner we start examining these things with honesty and with forthrightness, the better Ontario will be, the better this Legislative Assembly will be. And I do hope um, that we have a return to a fully functioning representative democracy immediately and as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Speaker.